Many thanks indeed, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. The power of social media. Well, it's very powerful indeed, isn't it? Um, ask the former rulers of all of these countries in the Middle East. Um, ask those in charge of high-speed rail systems. Ask those in charge of industrial facilities that have explosions or tragic accidents. Ask those people who make mistakes and attempt to conceal what really happened from the public. This power that is wielded by people who in their pocket have the, 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 the might of a printing press is transcendent, it's rising, and it's going to change the way that organizations and society do their business right around the world. Now, on my way here this morning, I was listening on that oldest form of media, uh, the AM radio off the air here in Hong Kong on, on the BBC World Service that the former governor of uh, Illinois, uh, Blagojevich, he was convicted to 14 years in prison for his, his crimes of corruption. And I can't think of a better example from my native North America of a mainstream media phenomena. He is the most famous corrupt American made famous where a story was fueled, developed, shaped, and given contour by its access to social media. I think there is a false dividing line between social media and mainstream media. They are part of a, of a media ecosystem that are all connected to each other. Now, we have primarily an Asian audience here today, so I just want to make the point that social media, the technology might be similar across different, different regions uh, different parts of the world, but each country may use social media in a different way. We recently did a study showing that, for example, in, in China, social networks are, are far more uh, dominant than in other Asian countries compared to um, their role in the, in the media mix compared to blog platforms or, or microblogs. So there's, there's no country called Asia. Each, each society has its own way of using this technology. And here in Hong Kong, there's no exception. Five million people, highly interconnected, great bandwidth. Um, this is a place where, where the richness and experience of social media is experienced to the max. Now, we just did a study recently comparing Asian and Western usage of social media. And we looked at how the Fortune 100 top, primarily Western multinationals, were using it. And we found that 80% of Western multinationals use a branded social media platform to communicate with people. And, and only 40% of the Asian corporation were using the same technology. Now, that was, that was 12 months ago. Now, more recently, we did the same study. We asked the same question, and we found that the Asian organizations have now approached the Western organization in their use of social media. You know, a, a, a social network like Facebook, for example, or a microblogging platform like, like Twitter. Now, in each country, though, there's different patterns of engagement. Um, South Korea, for example, is very active and, and dabbles in all of these different platforms, uh, corporate blogs and video sharing, and you name it. Other countries, uh, uh, Singapore, Taiwan, for example, um, organizations of influence and authority haven't adopted them in the same way. Now, the point I want to leave you with here today is that there's this rise of, of interest in using these social platforms for socially responsible purposes. Uh, some people think of it as social marketing, where we're fighting an evil, like deaths by car accidents. So do wear seat belts, or uh, we're fighting against a, an evil like smoking, or you know, don't smoke. That's, that's how we're, we're using this technology. That's the message. But beyond more simple or very clear utilitarian causes, I think it's important to understand some of these forces of change that are are sweeping the world of social media right now. How many of you, let's see a show of hands, how many of you use Facebook? Okay. How many of you use Twitter or Weibo? Okay. How many on Foursquare? Okay. All right. Well, what we see around the world is the decline of deference. People used to follow instructions from those in authority. Information, we used, to, we used to be passive consumers, small atomized people, receiving information through a small number of channels from big governments or big institutions or the big media, uh, big corporations, and we were told what to do. Well, now people are insisting on being powerful peer-to-peer co-creators. Um, 
You can click like on Facebook and you have declared yourself in favor of a cause or an issue like corruption, for example. If you like the fight against corruption, you have declared yourself in front of your social network, your friends, your family as the kind of person who opposes this evil. And the psychological research shows that once you have done that, you have created an image template of yourself, which from that point forward, you will act in a manner consistent to uphold. Now we also see, although there's no dislike button on Facebook yet, we see that stories that break through into the mainstream, like the Occupy movement, they first start on social media. Most people didn't hear about this first on CNN or BBC. Most people heard about it first on Facebook. Or look at that pepper spray incident that just happened in America on that campus. People learned about that first through the viral effect of social media. So, if they like something, they've created an image of themselves. And if you use social media to dislike something, you vented emotion. We'll get to that in a moment. I think it's important that you realize that there's a, bit of a great leveling effect. You know, great institutions like this or, or the government or corporations, they, they can now be a media company. Every, every, every company can be a media company um, because we can produce content, videos and links and experiences and we can create this stream. We can put the consciousness of the organization or of the cause online out there with the public. But NGOs, which have become super brands right around the world, cause groups, loose collections of individuals, um, confederation of, of activists, they can use the same technology to control the agenda, to create an agenda of their own. Now, what we see as well is that online networks, they, they, they can certainly play a huge role in offline protest. Did you know about the research that was done? Uh, Tahrir Square, in, Tahir, Tahir Square in, in Egypt. When did the explosion really occur? When did the people really come out and pro protest? It's when they turned the internet off, the research has shown. And when they turned the internet off, people could not find a place to express themselves anymore. They couldn't just click the like button. They couldn't just tweet. So they had to take action. They took to the streets and there was a public, a physical rallying point. It's important that people realize that. And of course, this isn't just something happening in the Middle East. This is something that's happening, the use of social technology to rally people to physical locations, to protest. This is happening right around the world. Now, every senior person in authority in the mainland remembers where they were when this happened not just because of the horror or the empathy for uh, the terrible tragedy and the lives of those affected, but because I think a lot of them were thinking, wow, what if something like this, what if some tragic accident occurred to my, my, my organization or my company? Um, and what we saw there, it, it revealed the true face of social media. It's like Weibo in China, for example, is the national nervous system online. This is the expression of popular Popular feeling. I was going to say thought, but really it's more raw than that. It's emotion. It's feeling. You know, people don't use social media uh, to have, uh, you know, long, linear, thoughtful debates. It's about expressing anger, fear, sadness, love, hate. That's how people are using it. And whether or not that's good for society, well, that's another question, but that's how it's being used. We all remember, many of us will have seen this terrible video of that, that little girl who was, who was hit by that truck and nobody took action or it took a while for action to be taken. Where did we first learn about this? Social media. What we've learned is that human experiences, every, the everyday awfulness of human experience or the everyday exhilarations of, of mankind at our best, this is what, this is what really affects people online. And I think for an issue like corruption, where it has such a disturbing and awful impact on, on destroying lives and holding countries and peoples back, I think, I think the force of this can be rallied to positive effect. Indeed, I think there's many opportunities here that can be exploited. You know, I look at, 
I look at the Singapore government and the prison service there, and you might be thinking, the prison service, how could they possibly use social media? Well, they have this yellow ribbon campaign, and you know, in the interest of transparency, I should tell you they're a client of ours. You know, they, they have invited people through their, through their online presence to volunteer or to donate or to employ a former convict, to use social media to integrate public activism into creating a, a positive public policy. Now, no discussion of corruption in the world today could occur as it relates to social media without mentioning this, this individual, Anna. Um, I was in India when this was reaching its, its peak. Every single one of the all news channels was filled with, with these images of mobilized people taking to the streets. And every Indian newspaper that I saw, at least the English ones that I could read, I mean, keep in mind there's over 100 million people who read a newspaper in India every day, and most of them are not reading English papers. It showed pictures of the movement, and then it broke down with pie charts and color infographics. The nature of people's interest in the story, what percentage were following it on Twitter or Facebook, um, how did people think the government was going to react? So social media was used as kind of a, a barometer or a gauge by the mainstream media to track this, this story. And by the way, for those of you who know about India, uh, this story was of particular interest to only a certain percentage of the population, um, a frustrated rising middle class uh, that sees their chances being stunted and their upward mobility being halted by per pervasive corruption. But because of social media, which by the way, in a country with relatively low internet penetration, it doesn't affect the majority yet. It, with it feeding the media mainstream, it looked like everybody, the vast majority of society, was out there participating in this cause. So social media can also have a, a distorting impact. It, it put corruption on the radar screen. It put momentum behind this movement but a highly motivated, media-savvy minority can command the perception of being the majority. And so this is something that we're not quite accustomed to yet and have to become adjusted to. I really like this, this citizen map project here in Hong Kong, um, where we have uh, the use of social technology um, to, to crowdsource intelligence from the people. Um, and I find that the main thing that we should take from this is the power of where, where data meets design. I don't know if you've noticed this in newspapers or you know, on Twitter. Um, the rise of these graphics. This is somebody's resume I'm showing you. This is, this is somebody's professional life, the data of their career projected over time. Well, I don't know if you've noticed this, but nobody has time to pay attention to stories anymore. We're so bombarded by stimuli, by marketing messages every day. You know, we used to have time to, to listen to a, a, a long form radio broadcast or to read a, a broadsheet newspaper. Well, that is on the decline. Media segments are much more brief. Nobody has time anymore. Most people stare fixedly at a mobile device or a tablet or a moving scrolling surface 90% of their waking hours. And so to get impact today, you have to communicate a story in the blink of an eye or in the snap of your fingers. Immediately, where data meets design, you've got to take the complexity of a story or a cause like corruption and make it easy to understand for somebody just at a glance. Now, I have to tell you, if you look at the force of, of public relations, and that's the industry that I work for, um, I think social media is changing the possibilities here in a way that can unleash these energies for people working in causes. You know, uh, World Economic Forum has identified 80 major global threats like climate change, for example. I think corruption may be one of them. Um, food prices, um, you name it. And what they found is that old systems and institutions are, are having trouble coping with the complexity and enormity and speed of these challenges. And, you know, corporations can't do it by themselves. Governments can't do it by themselves. They have to work together, and they have to build a crosshatch of, of brokerages, relationships between each other. And public relations 
because by its very nature, it understands how people um, have a relationship with each other. It's uniquely suited to achieve this. And I think what we see is the importance, therefore, of not thinking about social media. Don't think about it as one to mass communications. It's not just an online place to post a, a press release. The credibility doesn't come from the corporate control of the message. The credibility comes from the fearless, open, and transparent conversation with stakeholders, two-way conversations. You know, conversations involve listening. A lot of people mistake PR and media relations. They think it's just talking, just speaking, just telling. But communication begins with listening, active listening, and that's a very important message to understand. So I think increasingly, um, governments and other institutions need to engage average citizens using the power of social media um, to engage those people uh, who are whose participation is necessary to the achievement of broader social purposes. So public relations in the, the public interest is a very good friend of mine likes to say. Finally, a lot of a lot of governments, a lot of organizations, they like to, to boast about what they have done in the past. We see this especially with CSR and climate change. Well, here's, here's how many trees the Pulp and Paper Company has replanted, or um, you know, here's, here's how much we've, we've saved in carbon offsets. Um, I don't think people are interested in this day and age what we have done in the past. They want to know what it is we are setting out to achieve. There is almost no time span in social media. It's, it's living in the present constantly across a scrolling news feed. And so pointing to the future, declaring a purpose, listening to people, and fearlessly engaging in dialogue through this new media, I think that's the way to go to make the really compelling changes that society requires. Anyway, I thank you very much for your time and attention.